Hi, guys. I'm Trent. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks for having me again at one of your meetups, Ryan, and the rest of the organizers. It's been a while. It has. So uh, here I am. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a, a new project that we have at Big Chain DB called Ocean. Um, the title is A New Data Economy with Power to the People. So I'm first of all going to talk about this long standing dream that uh, many of us have had and our forebearers before us. And the dream is a decentralized, open, free flow of data. And people have, dreaming, have been dreaming about this since the beginnings of computers, um, from the 50s and the 60s and so on, um, from the beginnings of the ARPANET to the, the internet in the 70s, to the World Wide Web in the late 80s, early 90s. And here, this is Tim Berners-Lee, shortly after he invented the World Wide Web. Um, and uh, of course, it's, it's grown and grown and grown. So there's been this long standing dream um, for you know, just this flow of data for civilization, for society. But that's not really how things have worked out. And I'll get to some of the issues, but I'll first of all, I'll get to the root cause. Uh, so I came from the world of AI. Uh, I, I spent almost 20 years there um, doing AI algorithms. And maybe to get started, uh, my very first job as an AI researcher was in 1997. And I, I, I was given a job, I was given 20,000 data points of audio radar data. It was basically from a, a tank pointing its radar in all these different directions, and then listening, listening, listening. And um, that was the inputs, and then they had it all labeled. They had um, birds flying around, and people walking, and other tanks driving, and so on. And I had to come up with an algorithm that would automatically distinguish between you know, the birds and the other tanks, and so on. So I spent a whole summer doing this with my 20,000 data points. And in that summer, um, I came up with different algorithms, you know, different variants of genetic algorithms and neural networks and so on. And I managed to reduce the error from 45% to 35%. So that was my whole summer's work, improving the error. Maybe it was even 25%. So good for me, right? One in four times, it still fails. Um, and that was my summer's work. Um, this was in the late 90s, and guess what? This was the standard way you did things in the 90s, and even most of the 2000s, if you're an AI. You have a fixed data set, and you, you basically run a, you hide in your room for a month or a full PhD, and you c come up with your most accurate model, right? And then you publish a bunch of papers, and you get your PhD, and so on. And the stuff promptly doesn't get deployed, right? So you know what I did, 25% um, error, that's unusable, right? You really need 5% or 1% or 0.1% error. So, but there was a trickle of information. Some researchers started thinking differently. And what they, what they thought was, and these researchers here at Microsoft in, in early 2001 said, what if we just kept the same old algorithm, maybe even a stupid old boring al algorithm from the 50s or 60s, like k nearest neighbor, like just looking at the five nearest neighbors and then classifying from that. So they did this, and they had some other boring old algorithms too, like naive Bayes, which doesn't even care about how re variables relate. And they said, what if we just add more data? So we don't need to have some PhD locked in a room for four years. We just give it more data. And they, they, they did this. And in this case, they're doing a, they were doing a language task. So initially, um, if you looked at publications before this 2001 paper, you would see maybe four data points, right? It's like, you know, here's my naive Bayes, actually this one. Here's my KNN, and so on. And they would just be competing. OK, I'm 5% better than you, right? But if you look at it, they all suck, right? They're all terrible. It's all like 17% you know, error at, at most, right? But, and this is kind of where everyone is competing in their conference papers and so on. But, but, what if you actually had more data? So 10x more data, 100x, 1,000x, 10,000x more data. What happens? The accuracy goes up, 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 up. Or error goes from 17% all the way down to 1% just by adding more data, right? If you think about this, as an AI researcher, it's super embarrassing, right? A bunch of CSV files can do more than a summer or a PhD worth of research, right? So AI people don't really like to advertise this, but what it points to is the unreasonable effectiveness of data, right? So in this case, 1,000x more data gave 1,000x less error, right? And um, so uh, what that led to is by the mid-2000s, um, Google researchers and other companies like Facebook and so on started realizing this and just going like crazy. And um, deep nets, all these sorts of things, took it to the next level because you could have the capacity to have massive, massive data sets, you know, 100 million, 1 billion, 10 billion data points, and just learning on it, learning on it, thanks to Moore's Law. And what it's led to is, well, you have a bunch of companies, not that many, a handful actually, that are really awesome at gathering the data, holding it in these massive silos, and then extracting value from it with AI, 
What sort of value? Well, if you're Google, you take that, AI, that, that data, you build a model that makes um, it's more accurate than before because you have more data. Um, you use that model to sell ads. So higher click-through rate, more money, right? That's what Google does. That's what Facebook does. In Amazon's case, it's basically to give better recommendations, right? It's uncanny, right? I was actually on Amazon this morning buying um, some USB chargers, some lightning chargers, and then it recommended, hey, why don't you actually have this, um, you know, this plug-in as well, right? I'm like, actually, that's a good idea, right? So it, it is really good. It, like, it's like it's read my mind, right? It, it's, you know, it's, it's probably almost better than my wife at recommending this stuff, so um, certainly better than me. So that's actually really scary, right? And they're making more money, right? Amazon made more money from me today because it has really good AI, right? And um, this is what's happening. So we have all this, um, these, these companies that have become incredibly powerful, incredibly wealthy by massive data sets siloed up, right? So we're in this new data economy for our data society, but the power is in the hands of a small number of organizations. Here's a stat that scared the heck out of me. I don't know if you guys can read it well. It's okay, okay, I'll read it out. Google and Facebook now have direct influence over 70% of internet traffic. 70%. That was um, a, a stat from an essay published a couple months ago. The title of the, stat, the uh, publication is The Web Began Dying in 2014. So, well, that speaks on volumes on its own too. And there, there are a whole bunch of other stats that people have been starting to notice in the last one year, two years, three years that is really scary. It's not just scary because of the, the power accumulated into these companies, but keep in mind, remember the Snowden revelations? Prism, all that? Prism never shut down. Google has been supplying data to the US Department of Defense, the NSA, all these guys, since 2012. Microsoft, since 2007. So all that data that Google is gathering, guess what? It's all in Prism too, right? We are in a surveillance state, make no mistake, right? And um, more recently, I don't know if you guys saw the, um, the news from two weeks ago, um, there was a reporter from National Geographic. She was writing a story about um, some wildlife crimes, right? And partway through her story, her Google account froze up. And she's like, what's going on? So she tweeted, you know, what happened? It happened to a bunch of other people too. What was happening? Google algorithms had a glitch. And the glitch detected that they were, that she was breaking the terms of service. Somehow, you know, some, some crime that she was committing, writing about a terrorist act or something, right? And then they just shut her out, right? But if you think, and then Google said, oh, we fixed the glitch, we fixed the glitch, which means they have a more accurate model to detect whether you're a terrorist or not. So does that mean I actually can't write a term paper talking about Al Qaeda? Does that mean I can't actually write an article and complain about the government? I can't organize a, um, a, a, um, a protest against the government? This is a direct assault on our democracy, on our freedom, right? This is super dangerous. This is happening now. Keep in mind, every time you use Gmail and type things in, you are being watched, not just by Google, by the US government. And Google can shut you down like that. This scares me. So we have these data silos, we have this people farming, and we have this threat to freedom itself. There's a way to frame the core problem, right? And uh, my friend Lawrence Lundy with Outlier, maybe many of you might know him, uh, he summarized this problem as you have siloed data with no economic incentive to share. And you can break that down into two parts, siloed data and, well, no uh, economic incentive to share. What I'm going to do now is talk about what we can do about this. Because, you know, we can say, oh, oh, this is terrible, this is terrible, let's go run for the hills and hide, right? But we're not, we don't want to give up our cell phones, we don't want to give up our, our digital lives, we don't want to go back to a life expense expectancy of 30 years, right? Um, no, we, we, we want to have our cake and eat it too. So maybe there's a way to do that. And let's talk about that. So first of all, what can we do to break down these silos, these silos of information? Well, to start with, you have to ask yourself, right now we've got Google and Facebook and the like, and they've got amazing AI expertise and amazing data. But what about all the other enterprises? They actually have tons of data too. Uh, it's just sitting there, gathering dust, latent, right? They want to hire AI experts, but it's really, really hard because they're stodgy old dinosaurs and all the AI experts you know what they want to do? They want to start startups and make money or join Google for a $2 million signing bonus, right? And that's what's happening. So on the flip side, you've got all these AI startups, right? And there's all these researchers with lots of ideas and they know how to use this data and turn it into digital gold. But they're starving for data. 
So they have their fancy algorithms. They've got 25% error, 10% error, but you can't build a product from that. You need 1% error, 0.1%. So you've got on one side these enterprises that are starving for AI expertise, and on the other side, these AI folks that are starving for data. Let's connect them, right? Let's have a medium to connect them. And maybe not just one medium, but a whole bunch of mediums. What is that? Data marketplaces, right? Marketplaces where you can have the buyers and the sellers come in. And you don't want just one storefront, right, sitting there in the middle of the desert, you, because that would be centralized on its own. You need a whole bunch of them, right? Uh, and different ones competing for IoT data and competing for uh, personal data that people can buy and sell if they choose, and so on and so forth, right? But then, if you think about it, if you have different storefronts selling different data, you have a liquidity problem, right? Because each data set on its own is going to be just locked into that one store. So what you need is you need a common substrate, a common substrate that any one of these marketplaces can tap into and sell. That's what Ocean is. Ocean is a common substrate to unlock the data sets to be bought and sold on the data marketplaces, sitting side by side with the global data commons. So we've got the priced data, the for sale data on one side, and the free data on the other side. And overall then, it's actually about unlocking a data economy. Uh, an example for you guys is the following. Um, if you ever go into, a, um, say, kayak.com and, and you search, right, um, you'll get a bunch of results from different airlines, right? Uh, you know, I was, I'm flying to New York shortly, so I have results from everything from Aeroflot to, to Wow Air and all of this, right? If I go to wowair.com, I'll get exactly the same results just for Wow Air, right? With a completely different interface, by the way. If I go to Expedia, it's the very same results, right? They're all tapping into the same database. That database is called Sabre slash Amadeus, right? So basically, in the travel industry, we actually have a common database that all the online marketplaces use. It's a data substrate for just airline data, just selling that. It's centralized, but it's actually caused this unlocking of data sets and data marketplaces above. Ocean is Sabre for data itself. That's what Ocean is about. And of course, it's decentralized. I mean, otherwise, what are we doing, right? So um, that's what Ocean is. It's basically driving towards the pooling of the data, helping to unlock the data marketplaces where you still maintain high liquidity via this data substrate. So that was the first challenge, right? Getting rid of these data silos and instead encouraging the data to get pooled together. But there's a second part. How do you incentivize people to pool this data, right? What do you do? And so by a bit of background, in the beginning, there was Bitcoin, right? And you know, many of us probably have been following Bitcoin since you know, maybe even 2008, if you're really on top of things, but 2009, 2010, and so on, right? But in the beginning, there was Bitcoin, right? And uh, you know, obviously, it's changed a lot of things, $100 billion plus economy, and so on. But, and of course, the technology below is blockchains, right? And you know, we, we sort of saw the rise of blockchains in 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, and the amazing thing about these, there's quite a few very cool features, right? They're decentralized, right? No single entity owns or controls, sort of public utilities. Uh, they're immutable. Once you've written to it, it's there for good, right? Um, for really good audit trails, all that. Aligning incentives, you have this whole community pointed in the same direction, great. Or, you know, if you've got a white paper and a dog, maybe you can do your ICO, right? So, and of course, there are good ICOs too, but some of them, you know, well, that's for another talk. That's for upstairs, right? No. Um, anyway, so basically, there's a lot of really cool things about blockchains, but there's one more that hardly anyone ever talks about, right? What is it? It's actually the not-so-obvious blockchain superpower. It's maybe the most powerful one of all. With blockchains, you can get people to do things, to do stuff. Right? How might that look? Well, you have to come up with economic incentives and bake it into the network as block rewards. Right? So once again, with blockchains, you can get people to do stuff. Let's look at what this means. Let's use Bitcoin as an example. So inside Bitcoin, what is Bitcoin trying to do? At the core, it's basically trying to store this log of transactions. Right? It's just a pure play blockchain. But it wants it to be as secure as possible. It's trying to maximize the security of this, of this list of transactions, right? It's just this big, huge transaction log, right? So it defines security as compute power. And then it says, um, if you have security defined that way, it means it's super expensive to roll back changes on the transaction log. Expensive as in compute expense, right? It's actually a democracy where every individual is an electron, right, in a sense. So what the formula for block rewards is, the expected value that your block reward is proportional to your hash power of the actor 
and, um, and then the number of tokens dispensed each block, right? Right now you get 12.5 Bitcoins every 10 minutes, right? So, so that's the economic incentive. That's the block reward for Bitcoin. Straightforward. Um, maximize the security of the chain. Um, to make it a bit simpler, um, you've got these block Bitcoin mining rewards, that, this economic incentive. Um, you get block rewards if a couple things happen. You're running a full node, and you have gobs of compute power. Um, you don't need gobs, but then the probability of actually getting reward is you know, less than the lifetime of the universe, right? So I could, you know, maybe this laptop is a full node, but good luck actually getting something. You know, or you can pool it and so on, but overall, um, if you have gobs of compute power, then you might have a chance. And this causes people to do really like, amazing things. Um, we've seen the rise of ASIC farms where people spend $100 million to design and manufacture that chip on the most modern process, right? TSMC, 11 nanometers. What we have behind here is actually one of those mining farms, right? You know, one of these super advanced um, farms. And overall, uh, the amount of mining power going into Bitcoin these days is more than the top 500 supercomputers combined, right? That's pretty secure, right? And basically, that comes down to the single objective function that Bitcoin had. Um, just as a quick aside, you know, I spent a long time in AI, and um, d part of that was designing evolutionary algorithms. And I've come to realize that design of these tokenized ecosystems, these, these public utility networks, looks a lot like design of evolutionary algorithms. So on the left side, I talk about the ecosystem. On the right, you've got the EA. On the left side, you've got a block reward function. In an evolutionary algorithm, it's an objective function. So you're trying to minimize or maximize something. Um, uh, so it, maximize hash rate versus, say, minimize error in, say, training a neural network, right? Um, in, in blockchains, you've got miners and token holders. These are humans in a network. In an EA, you've got individuals. These are basically computer agents running around, right? And they're in a population, right? So once again, similar things. You've got a block reward interval. You've got a generation. E every interval or every generation, you kind of update. You give tokens, uh, all these sorts of things. Um, and in a tokenized ecosystem, you know, you can't control a human. People will run around and start mining pools and start ASIC farms and buy and sell Bitcoin. And all you can do, though, is you can reward them for doing the things you want them to do, give tokens. And you can potentially punish them for doing things you don't want. In proof of stake systems, it can be like slashing stake, right? Or you can also punish people to, for doing bad implementations by hacking, right? You know, blo every blockchain has a built-in bug bounty system, right? Kind of amazing. You know, Bitcoin is a $130 billion bug bounty system. Pretty cool, right? Uh, and on the side of EA, it's similar. You can't control these individuals. They might mutate. They might cross over. You don't really care. They do what they want. But uh, what you do is you reward the ones that do well. You let them reproduce and have babies, right? And if they do bad, they're dead. They're gone, right? So basically, there's a lot of similarities between these tokenized ecosystems and EAs. So, and what's cool then is all the knowledge that has been developed here since the 60s when uh, genetic algorithms were invented by John Holland, and actually independently here in Germany too, um, um, all of that, those ideas, you can actually start to apply to tokenized ecosystem design, right? So let's talk about economic incentives for ocean. What is it that we're trying to do with ocean towards addressing these issues I talked about? Overall, what we're trying to do is maximize the supply of high quality data, or to be more precise, to maximize the supply of curated data. We leave it up to the agents out there, the actors, to curate, to choose what's good and what's not, right? And so overall, what this means is that you're rewarding people who are curating data and making it available, serving it up, et cetera, right? What does curating mean? It means betting on the data itself. And this is via a curation market invented by Simon de Louvier, leveraging that, right? It's sort of like you have a mini ICO for every single data set, right? And so if I'm early in this, uh, the very first person to serve it up, like to make it available, sorry, or if I um, am right after that, it costs me less to invest than later on, later on, later on. So, um, and basically, that, therefore, you're rewarding the tastemakers, the early adopters, and so on, right? So um, overall, then, the formula is the following. The expected rewards, right here, is proportional to the stake in the data set, right here, um, and the popularity, right? So you need... Um, People to predict that something will be popular, bet on it, and it actually needs to be popular. That when those two stars align and you serve up the data, that's where Ocean comes through. Another way of thinking about it is it's a curated, uh, it's, a, it's a curation market with proof of work, a proof of work curation market. So we've got um, the betting on the data, the actual popularity. Um, this is the token rewards um, per time interval, sort of like you know, every 10 minutes for Bitcoin. 
Um, and then finally, this is a download ratio. There's a particular attack. If someone uploads something and then download it, it lets themselves, 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 then um, that's a problem. So there's a, just a download ratio of uploads versus downloads. So overall, that is um, the, the trick. Now, you might notice a couple things. Uh, I won't go into this, but we can talk after in questions. Uh, there's a log on this, and there's a log on this. You might ask why. What's going on there, right? Well, this actually comes from tricks in the AI world. Um, if you have logs here, then it actually focuses on the order of magnitude instead of um, the f fixed value. And humans themselves reason much more in terms of orders of magnitude. They, they, they think about increase in percentage up and down. The other thing that it does is, if you don't have this here, these things, what you're going to have is someone uploads a data set that becomes super, super popular, and everyone just bets on that. But when you have the log, it means that people have to spread out. You have to have diversity of data sets, right? Because um, basically, you can only get so many rewards um, for one data set. If you want to get twice as many rewards, you actually would have to put in 10x the stake. If you want to have 3x the rewards, you would have to put in 100x the stake. So you might as well actually stake a whole bunch of data sets, right? So it's implicitly encouraging diversity of data sets, which is actually what we want, right? So to kind of summarize, with, with Ocean, the mining rewards are you get block rewards if A, you've bet on a data set, and B, you've made it available when asked, right? And sort of made it available when asked, this in includes the popularity part then, right? And of course, um, like any tokenized ecosystem, blockchain network, it's got a bunch of miners. We like to call them keepers sometime. And um, the main blocks inside are, um, there's a core proof. You know, every single blockchain ecosystem needs a proof in there. Um, Bitcoin has proof of work, you know, finding the nonce. Um, Filecoin, when it deploys, it will have a proof of space time to sort of prove that you have stored that data for a while. Um, uh, Steemit has proof of human work where you contribute. Um, it's proving that you have contributed interesting pieces in a medium style way, et cetera, et cetera. So in the case of Ocean, it's actually proving that you have served up the data to make it available. It's a bit like Filecoin's proof of space, space time where you have the data, except it doesn't really, really care where you stored it in the past. You can copy it last minute from S3. It doesn't care, right? Um, so that's the, the core proof. And then um, some of the other main building blocks, you've got the block rewards mechanism, you've got the curation market. And um, there are several possible attacks where people can um, be bad actors. So we need to have an actor's registry. And this is drawing from AdChain. It's called a um, tokenized, uh, 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 well, it's a tokenized registry. And um, basically, to be part of the, the ecosystem, to submit data, you need to um, submit stake um, in order to, to, to be there. And there's a vetting period. And during that time, people can vote for you or against you. And um, if they see you as a, a potential good actor, they will let you in. They are incentivized to have good actors because that means the, the tokens will rise in value. And conversely, they're disincentivized to have bad actors. So that's what this is about. But at the very, very core, it's really about the curation market with block rewards. And then everything else is machinery to support that. Um, so in terms of applications, uh, we started work on this actually well, we started thinking about it a lot um, late last fall. I published a couple of blog posts, um, one on blockchains for big data. In that case, you know, the main conclusion was, oh, wow, data marketplaces are really important. That's a, a, a linchpin. A, a couple of months later, um, I published a post on blockchains for AI. Once again, all roads led to data marketplaces. So we started to go down that path. Um, and in early 2017, uh, we iterated with DEX um, on a data marketplace. And in being, building Ocean, we were actually working with DEX. DEX is a, a, was a centralized data exchange out of Singapore. Now we're working with them to basically have a decentralized data exchange protocol. So Ocean itself is not a, a data exchange or data marketplace. It's powering them. It's one level lower. Another one, though, uh, another partner that we started working with and announced in May is Toyota, uh, Toyota Research Institute, to be precise. So this is the research arm of the world's largest car company. And they saw that in the world of, of automotive and cars, um, you know, in the USA, there are more than 1 million deaths per year from, from car accidents. And the leading cause of this is human error, right? We basically, we suck at driving. We've only been doing it 100 years. We didn't evolve for it. So we crash into each other and kill each other, right? So um, people have seen that if you have self-driving cars, you can actually dramatically reduce that um, error rate. Um, and the challenge is, though, the algorithms are there, but you need more data, right? And uh, so McKinsey calculated you need about 1 trillion miles driven. Uh, Toyota realized, oh, wow, we could try to do that ourselves, but it's going to take a long time and cost a lot of money. But guess what? Daimler wants this. Uber wants this. Mercedes wants this. I mean, that's Daimler, sorry. Volkswagen, et cetera, right? So what if you could pool your data, all of these car companies together, and everyone ship this stuff sooner, right? 
That's a win for the car companies, and it's a win for humanity, right? The thing is, they're all big enterprises. It's not like they're all going to sit down and hug and sing kumbaya, right? So they can't just pool. You need some sort of economic mechanism for them to work with each other. And basically, that's what a data marketplace is about. So with Toyota, uh, we actually built a prototype data marketplace just to get a feel for this. Um, and then basically, uh, we announced this at Consensus in May. And we have continued iterating with Toyota since then um, towards, this, um, towards this goal and also in talks with the, some other um, automakers. So some overall applications, you know, what unlocking data unlocks uh, with Ocean? Uh, the main thing is equalizing the opportunity for access to data and access to the benefits of AI. It's about democratizing data, right? That's the high level. But then a key thing is this is actually squeezing out the data silos, you know, the people farming that's going on, the complete risk to, to the future of society and freedom, right? So this is the main, main thing ultimately, right? But of course, there's other things, you know, um, a sister company of DEX is actually um, doing Parkinson's research based out of Munich. And um, um, just like my experiences um, from my very first job as an AI researcher in, in the 90s, um, they are usually working with very limited data sets. You're, you're trying to build a model of whether or not someone might have Parkinson's in the future, right? But if you only have, you know, 10,000 data points, your model is limited. What if you have a million data points, right? The challenge is there's these silos all over the world. So is there a way to basically mine the data from all of these different um, silos, yet at the same time preserve privacy? And the answer is these days, yes. There's, um, you can bring compute to the data. You can even let the data stay encrypted using tools like homomorphic encryption. And um, these things overall basically can unlock a win-win situation where people, scientists, can actually um, build really great models for early detection of cancer and Parkinson's and so on. And at the same time, you can retain privacy. Uh, one final example I've talked about already, self-driving cars for fewer accidents and more mobility. You know, people who maybe couldn't drive, now they can get around more easily. So to wrap up, we've lost the web, right? Um, so let's reclaim it and make it better. Let's build a new data economy that gives power to the people. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, go ahead. So, if I own data, um, how do I do I install an ocean node, or uh, how do I actually interact with the ocean? And, and what? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. So the question is, um, if I own data, how do I um, basically get it into the system? How do I interact? Do I install a node, etc.? Um, so there's a, a few mechanisms. At the core, Ocean is its own network, right? Just like Bitcoin or Ethereum or, a big, or IPDB and so on. Um, generally, for the end users, you, don't, you shouldn't have to install a node. You could be going through um, a, th a third party client, think like a wallet or, or whatever, or some web API, some, some web page. And um, you might be going, you're probably going to be going through a data marketplace. DEX is standing up a data marketplace. We're also iterating with many other companies that are building their own data marketplaces centralized and decentralized. So um, you, most of the time, you would be just iterating with one of these, with DEX or otherwise. Um, you wouldn't have to iterate directly. If you want, um, you could put your stuff into Ocean directly, but Ocean itself isn't designed for, the pri uh, for pricing, right? The pricing happens at the marketplace level. Ocean itself, at the very, very core, it's simply a curation market for data with the sort of proof of work attached on, right? So it's basically um, a, a curation proof network, if you will, or a curated proof network. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I give away my data. I have to trust the uh, the data marketplace uh, of FX or whoever yeah. provides that uh, that they don't uh, mess around with it. Or uh, not necessarily. So I mean, those marketplaces, some are decentralized, some are centralized, right? So um, you are making a claim on copyright when you submit to the marketplace or to Ocean directly, and. Um, that claim, um, that there's actually proofs around that too. I won't get into that. Um, this goes back to even our ascribe days where we did sort of copyright stuff. Um, but um, you're putting it on there. You're making this claim, um, and people will vet that claim. And uh, if if you have decentralization at the level of marketplace, then um, they can't really act badly because you know someone will call them out. Or or and, and also at the ocean level, it's decentralized. So whatever claims you're making are going to get recorded as well, right? So, yeah, sure. Um, there's a question back there for. I have another question which relates to the question before. Uh -huh. um, so, technically, um, if I'm giving away my data, where is my data then stored? Is it not marketplace? Is it just a linkage between my data? 
Yeah, um, yeah, so the question is, if I'm giving away my data or selling it, where is my data being stored? And um, it's up to you. So Ocean does not store the data. Um, Ocean is basically a layer um, to um, curate and give tokens to reward people to incentivize them to share data, right? So Ocean is incentivizing the sharing of data, making it available. Um, you have um, IPDB, uh, um, basically big chain DBs, um, public net, storing their metadata, um, which is like who owns it, the claims, all of that. But then the data itself, it's up to you. So you have a few options, right? You could store it uh, on premise behind a firewall, encrypted if you want. Uh, you could store it on a cloud like S3, or you could store it on a cloud decentralized like Filecoin. It's up to you. And there's certain things that it would be a bad idea to do, right? So for example, um, if you've got medical data, you shouldn't be putting it on the cloud at all, even on a public net encrypted, because when quantum happens in five years, 10 years, then it's all free and in the open, right? So um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. And then and sometimes, right, if the data is um, on, the, on the client side um, still, like uh, uh, staying where it is, you can bring compute to the data. And it looks basically like a fancier data query, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you don't get rewarded for putting your, making your data available. The block rewards only come when people start downloading it, right? And then the block rewards are proportional to how much people bet about its popularity. So if you upload a, or if you make a crappy data set available, someone downloads it, they're like, this is a piece of garbage, I won't bet on it. So basically, there will be no, like, the price of that data will be super low, like no one will care. And price as in the, the betting, like, it's free for anyone to download the data, right? Yeah. Um, there's another question here. Uh, go ahead. I know what you mean. So the question overall is, are there incentives above and beyond um, just the sort of popularity of the data for things like uh, privacy and so on, right? So um, one thing uh, overall, um, we're trying to basically push that to the users as much as possible to think about, because otherwise it gets crazy, right? So we want to have a very simple system. However, um, one thing that we see that will be an additional feature, uh, we have a white paper that will come out not right away, but in coming months um, that talks about this in detail, um, is labels. So um, it, you can basically have data itself that's labels, and then there will be curation markets on the labels themselves. And those, it will be a label attached to a data set. And then people can basically bet on whether they think that label is valid or not. And once you have labels, you can have labels saying, this needs to be on German soil. This is health data. This should never be on a public net. And, and then w with that, because there's an economic incentive to get that right, then um, a lot of um, uh, powerful things will fall out. Um, another really cool benefit of the labels is you can actually have emergent hierarchies, um, essentially subreddits for given groups of data sets. So um, labels buys you a lot um, in terms of privacy, annotation, security annotation, and just uh, sort of navigating and discovering data sets. More questions? Um, about the logarithmic um, function in the, in the, in the, in the puppets. So uh, maybe this is too technical, but isn't there a civil attack uh, possible by me publishing, let's say, two very similar data sets, and then I earn twice so the logarithm becomes different? Uh, yeah, so if you publish two similar data sets, um, um, before you would have had, if, if you have just one data set, then a bunch of people would vote on just that data set, bet on it. If you publish two, then um, maybe you know, people, if, people, if they're equal, people might just put you know, half their stake in one and half in the other, or they might just put all their stake in one, right? Uh, but of course, people are going to be commenting on this, labeling it, and so on. So over time, um, people aren't going to want to deal with the data sets you submit because they're kind of uh, dishonest, right? So the market will um, essentially take care of this. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should have repeated the question. The question for that was, um, if there's uh, you know, someone publishing very, very similar data sets, um, then uh, isn't that like a civil attack? And yeah, the answer is, um, it's basically they're, they're spreading themselves thin. So question here. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so the, to, to that question, just for everyone's sake, so um, the, the actor's registry is to solve certain classes of civil attacks, and that is exactly um, one of the main reasons for it, yeah. So that's great if you apply that to like proof of stake, then you could like do the stake in proof of stake system. Uh -huh. And what's the, what's the kind of trade off of that? Uh, well, this is a proof of stake system. So what's the trade, the trade off in having this uh, actor registry? Uh, well, so yeah, so overall, so if we had an actress registry versus not, so if we didn't have one, then a bunch of the, the sort of mechanisms that uh, we, we need in order to avoid attacks wouldn't be there, and we'd have attacks that could debilitate the system. By having it, there is a trade-off, um, and that is um, uh, it's an ad chain style way of entering. So what that means is um, if you want to enter and start using the system, you have to stake some tokens, and then there's a vetting period. Right now, we've set it to 28 days. We'll see when we release. Um, and during that time, other people can say, oh, yeah, he's good, he's not good. And if, you want to, if someone wants to vote against me, they, they put down stake and vote against me. If someone wants to vote for me, they, they put down stake. And um, after those 28 days, it all gets tallied up. And um, uh, if all the votes are for you, uh, like if the majority is for you, the majority of votes, then you're in. Um, and everyone who voted against you loses. Uh, and vice versa then, too. So if, um, if the votes say you're out, then, everyone, then you lose your stake, and all the people who voted for you lose your stake. Um, so that would be, I think, did that fully answer? I think I'm missing something. Um, oh, yeah, there's a second piece. So um, this is friction to coming into the system then, right? But what if, say, um, you know, can we overcome that somehow? And um, so what if uh, I'm already in the system, I'm in the whitelisted actors registry, and I know you. Uh, and I'm like, hey, I trust you. You know, you should come in and trade data. And you're like, yeah, I know, but I've got 28 days. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. So uh, what we're currently planning to do to address that is something from the Open Bazaar system called trust is risk. And what that means is I'm vouching for you. I'm putting um, ocean tokens worth of stake um, to vote for you, and then you can join. And at any point in time for the next 28 days, whatever, you can grab the tokens I, I put there and run away. Right? So I'm trusting that you're not going to do it. So I'm essentially vouching for you um, with, my, with my tokens. Right? I'm putting my money where my mouth is about your reputation. So um, that basically helps to remove the friction for onboarding. Um, I'll just take one over here to mix it up. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, I have a question regarding the proof of work. Uh, like, I cannot draw the parallels from the, how Bitcoin is printing. Like, it, it's all cash uh, over there. Uh, here, the, 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 the miner actually solves uh, the betting system, basically. Uh, so overall, it's uh, basically the, the work that is being done is making the data available. It's spending bandwidth to basically make that data available, as well as getting that data from somewhere, maybe storing it, and then putting it out there and proving that you had that. But basically, it's making it available by hell or high water, right? So that's the overall, I guess the question for everyone, you know, uh, you, if there's proof of work or proof of stake, what's the proof, what's it doing? And the answer is, it's proof of availability, proof of making data available by serving it up, whatever. Um, so, so that's the main work that's being done. There's also a kind of a softer proof, which is actually proof of claim that you have the rights to put this thing up there, right? And that's softer. It's harder to solve. And, and within that, what we have is um, you're making a claim. Well, first of all, there's the actor's registry. So you, you have a bit of a vetting there. But then when you upload it, you're actually making a claim of copyright. And um, if other people can make, uh, once again, claims against that back and forth in sort of a challenge response mechanism, like Truebit and others use. And, um, that still leads to a few possible attacks. So you still need um, sort of a last resort system. And that last resort system is um, basically third party arbitration. And what we're going to be plugging in there, uh, we're right now iterating with the folks at Materium, um, Vinay Gupta and, and those folks, where basically, if all else fails, uh, you still have legal recourse. And this is actually really, really useful because um, if people know that even if they kind of you know, game the system and hack it in some way, um, if they sign up to use the system, um, and they, they abuse it badly, badly, badly. There is the, still the full weight uh, of the world's legal system against them if they act badly. And so it converts what would normally be a zero-sum game in the network to a positive-sum game, right? And this is what Ian Grig Grig writes about in the blockchain constitution, what they're building into EOS, for example. And actually, Cosmos has some of it, too. So <coughs> kudos to Cosmos. Question back here. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so overall the question is, um, can we uh, um, track how the ownership is tracked? What stops um, him from downloading the data and making it available again, right? And I'll break that in, into two answers as well. So when you upload data, you are making a copyright claim, and that claim is immutable, right? 
And if you're actually making a false claim, then um, ultimately you have the full force of the law. But of course, you don't want to say, okay, you know, some tiny flip of switch and suddenly you have this army of lawyers against you, right? So you really want sort of um, sunny day tech, rainy day law, right? So the vast majority of the time, there should be incentives within the system to, to resolve itself. And this is where basically you have, whenever you upload the data, people are actually vetting that data to, to see, it, do we believe that this actor has put something in that's good or not, right? So, um, and if they believe that you've done something maliciously, then they can kill your stake and you, can, you actually get booted out of the system, right? So that's the current design. Um, and overall, if it's found that you've um, used this data that isn't yours and gained from it, then you're, you'll, um, it can end up in a court of law, right? So we actually do have the legal recourse once again. Not most of the time, right? We're really trying to have good defaults to just, you know, leveraging the economic incentives. So I, I get punished, then I post the same data again? Uh, you, if you don't have the rights. If it's public domain, it doesn't matter, right? But if you, if you download data and it's um, public domain and you make it available yourself again, then um, people are going to be going for that first data set because it's already got all the popularity, right? Sorry? If it's not public domain? If it's not public domain, well, that, that's the first part of my answer, right? Um, where basically uh, it means that you're actually violating the law, you're committing fraud. In some countries, that's jail time. So have fun with that. Question. Uh, so I actually have two questions. So first is, how do you track downloads? So if you only make downloads, they don't be through the network. So you upload it somewhere, but the location is only known to the network. Yeah. Networks. Yeah. How? And then the node proxy the data and can download, right? Uh, well, I, I can answer that. So uh, maybe I'll answer, then you'll ask the second part. Okay. So the question is, how do I track downloads, right? And overall, here it says. Um, you know, it doesn't say the reward equals, you know, K times this, times this, times this. It's the expected reward, right? And this is exactly like Bitcoin. So here we take the idea of stochastic payments, just like Bitcoin. So the initial system that we actually designed was tracking all the things. And there's all these messages flying back and forth, right? But that gets, you know, you have this just explosion of messages. You know, it's O to the N squared and the bandwidth being used, right? But Bitcoin, you know, uh, it, it has a really sneaky answer to this. And by the way, if any of you guys just do token design, you'll, you'll find yourself keeping going back to the Bitcoin paper. There was a bunch of super sneaky things that Bitcoin did that only someone with experience um, would have known, you know, it, you know, someone who would have done digital cash in the 90s or whatever, right? So in, in this case, um, the inspiration from Bitcoin is the stochastic payments. And um, so Bitcoin, if you look at the formula for Bitcoin first, right, the expected reward it's just proportional to your hash power, right? But that doesn't mean every 10 minutes, everyone gets a fraction of Bitcoins. No, one entity gets a bunch of Bitcoins, right? Propor uh, and the dice gets rolled, and um, you, the, the, um, basically your, your chance of winning is proportional to your hash power, right? So, um, but only one winner comes out. That's why you have the expected. It has high variance, right? But it's still the same expected value. If you want to smooth out the variance, that's where the mining pools come in. So you let the mining pools emerge on top. That's exactly what Ocean does too. So here, we've actually got expected value. It's not you know, R equals K times, it's just expected value. It's stochastic payments, mining pools will emerge on top. And then it actually resolves all, all these bandwidth um, issues, they just melt away. So thank you, Bitcoin. But the downloads go through the node. Uh, the, the downloads do go through that node, yeah. And it has an additional benefit here, which is really, really cool, right? If you have a bunch of different parties um, betting on data because they think it's great, it's an automatic CDN, right? A content delivery network. It just adapts to more and more popular data. So if there's a super popular data set and a thousand people ha um, are betting on it, they're all incentivized to serve it up so that they get their block rewards. Whereas if there's one really crappy data set that no one cares about, no one is serving it up, or maybe one person, right? So it's automatic CDN. Uh, the second question yeah. is, Uh, yeah, and you can also see what the, you know, the price of the data set is so far and stuff too, right? Or social signals on social media, whatever, yeah. Is there anything preventing a situation when I have no, like someone new enters the market and I have no way of validating if the data is selling is good? Well, you can download it. Well, then why would you bet on it, right? Like, I mean, you can and just take a chance or you buy it, you vet it for yourself, right? So some people will take the chance. They'll just buy everything that goes for sale and some is good, some isn't. So the market will sort that out. 
I should answer, the question was overall, how do I have vet data that um, people have posted for sale and I, I don't want to buy it? And I, what I'm saying is you want to vet it, then buy the data. Um, question, uh, sorry? Maybe we can, yeah, take the rest of the questions after and yeah, okay. we'll go on to the next. Okay, thank you very much everyone.